Good morning, everyone. It's September 6, 2024, and uh, we are here for the Colorado Forest Health Council Legislative Committee meeting. This is, uh, I'll call this meeting to order. And um, Courtney, are you able to do roll call or would you like me just to um, do that? But I would appreciate it if you could. Thank you. I'll go through the roll. Samantha Albert. Present. Thanks. Thanks, Samantha. Katie McGrath Novak. I know she's in Durango with me, um, wrapping up the Forest Collaboratives Network, so I imagine she won't be here today. Um, Pat Dorsey. Good morning. Good morning. Christina Bury is also here in Durango, so I don't think she'll be joining us. Uh, I think Kim James is here for her. Oh, James, are you the designee? I can be. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Commissioner Jody Shattuck McNally. Present. Good morning, Commissioner. Mark Morgan. Present. Good morning, Mark. Julie Stencil. Good morning, Julie. I see you. Um, Vice Chairman Selvin White Skunk. Excused. Uh, Commissioner Veronica Medina. Here. Thank you. Good morning. And Allison Lurch. I know Allison is, is off um, working today offline. So we do have enough for quorum, which is great. Thank you, Courtney. So we um, don't have the minutes that, because Courtney has been running all over the state. She's in Durango and there's just a lot for us to capture from that last meeting. So we will do both of those at the next meeting. However, I thought, before we go to and start having another presentation in our head, you know how last year we started with um, that list to keep ideas from the presentations um, that are um, things we want to explore more or topics from the presentations. Um, I was hoping that um, we could start that list today so then we can do it again at the end of the meeting for the um, for this presentation, which we'll start here in a little bit. So um, Courtney, um, or I can do it too. Um, do we want to um, just kind of remind everyone about what we talked about? about did, were you going to send out those slides with the minutes when you get them done? Yes. And actually, the slides are ready. I could send them right now so that cool. everyone could even pull them up. So as we're getting those sent, anyone have some big um, takeaways or items from that list? I thought it was phenomenal to kind of just go through that again um refresh and and remember and kind of think about all the work that's being done is there any um thoughts right off the bat from that presentation two weeks ago about those topics anyone want to comment on the presentation you guys felt like that was what you were hoping to get and look for and and good information thumbs up Thumbs down. I have the list in front of me right now, so I'm, I'm not sure where we're at. Well, we're going to talk, you know, with the last presentation, we had a um, presentation from Allison and Courtney on all those items that we, um, and so um, I know you had some things you were, you um, had, Mr. Morgan, but anybody else, any of the items about um, the fur worm or the, the I, I was, I appreciate the, um, water um fire ready um watersheds reminder and so i wanted to kind of explore and talk about that a little bit more um because i did have some watersheds approach me about that and that their interests and so i was curious about um putting that on the list and exploring if that's something that legislatively um is important to look at since you know that's kind of a priority area for us up here is protecting the watershed so does anyone else have any comments about the is it fire ready watersheds it's or, wildfire ready water wildfire ready yep thank you we i all need someone go ahead um chris sturm is is in Durango right now. I, I have a feeling I won't see him again this morning, but I could ask him if he if there is some sort of need from that program, if the cro program needs anything um, that the legislative committee might be able to support on, because I think even just 
this week I've heard of many people doing uh, participating in the Wildfire Ready Watersheds program, and um, it was receiving a lot of praise and wonderful attention this week. Great. Mr. Morgan, your hands up. Yes. Uh, a lot of these issues <clears throat> are critical to forest health, but I struggle with what things that we can do legislatively to move them along. A lot of them uh, uh, translating into a legislative thing that we can do. Money's going to be short in funding coming up here, I think. And so we can ask for money for programs, but I guess at some point we need to, I guess, like I say, I still struggle with what we can do legislatively that we could propose that would be helpful in meeting these goals. I, maybe I haven't explained myself well, but I see a disconnect right there that I have trouble with. And I would like some help from you folks in, in ways that you think we could what can we propose to change that? Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah, I think I think what you're saying is um, it's great for us to ask and talk about these things, but if we've been told and kind of signaled from the state legislature, there's probably not a lot of money to do anything. I still feel, um, and I think you're, I think that's a good point. But I think if we don't keep talking about the needs and the funding or bringing up what is necessary what we think is important just like we brought up the workforce development i think we still have to keep asking and and saying the need and kind of bringing that up because if, if we don't then they'll think oh they must be fine i just figure we have to keep, we keep, have to bring the recommendations whether there's money there or not and hopefully they find something i agree with that what i guess i'm looking for is what legislative things could we suggest actual changes that would not come with a price tag so much that's kind of what i'm trying to come to are there things out there that we could ask for or changes that we could suggest that are made that don't come with a price tag so to speak changes of policy changes of direction changes of funding that we already have and so you know we've been given a mandate to try to do this forest health council and we've had some specific things that were asked for is there anything out there that we could <clears throat> that we could suggest changes wise in existing agencies or existing uh, one that leaps to mind for me is that I think we need a whole change in direction in high school education in this state. I think there's all kinds of programs, not just about forestry. But I talk to high school students and everything all the time, and they feel a huge disconnect between what goes on in school and where they're headed in life right now. And so we spend a lot of money on programs. Education has a budget, a fairly big budget. They could tell you that it's not enough. But our our can we direct some of that to better serve the environmental needs and the forest needs in the state of Colorado? you know is there any room to do that i guess that would be one suggestion i would have but i think there are lots of them like that great i appreciate that pat yeah this is more a question for courtney and james perhaps but um you know i think the water the fire ready watersheds and fur worm and um the co-swap and all of those are like excellent and they've made colorado a leader in being able to make our forest more more fire resilient i was wondering is there anything we can do just i don't see it legislatively as much as maybe administratively to make sure that those programs are interconnected and um you know people are i think we have some you know, community navigators and things like that that help people access grants and match them up with federal funding and all of that. But that's the only thing I think of is, you know, there's a lot of money out there, but is it coordinated in a way in the grant application deadlines at the same time of year so that people know, you know, that kind of thing? Good point. Courtney. Yeah, 
that's a good question. And actually, even just here at the Collaborative Summit, um, we did this crowdsourcing activity. And one of the things that rose, rose to the top is, could there be co more coordination amongst state grant programs? And I think CoSwap, Furworm, and Wildfire Ready Watersheds were all named um, to make it easier for people on the ground to access those funds. And so, yeah, I hear that need from you. And, and we heard it from like a large group yesterday. And um, I, I do imagine there is potential for that. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I think, yeah, it's worth writing down and um, diving into a little bit more. And I don't know if that's like James and Chris Sturm and Allison and I talk about whether there's something to be done and if that's a legislative thing or something else, but I think it's, it's definitely worth noting. So I'm gonna put that in the notes. Great suggestion. Um, anybody else? And again, I think it's great that we look for things that are don't take money and that maybe we can go back and like strengthen that process. And I'm glad that was brought up as collaboratives. Um, but I I, um, I don't want us to be um, shy away from anything that's a good idea or important to bring forward that costs money because we never know. Um, it, um, it's something that could be um, found a way, I guess. So, Pat. I'll bring up one more crazy idea because I see Julie Stencil on the call, but are, is, are there anything we could be doing more to work with utilities and things like that to make sure that, you know, the grid is protected? Um, you know, even if it's, Julie, I'm looking at ways for you to get involved in lo local forest collaboratives that are doing the work to make sure that we're protecting infrastructure within those collaboratives. Yeah, and, and short, thank you, Pat. The short answer is yes. And that's, that's when Mr. Morgan was talking, that's, that's what I was, that's kind of where my brain was going, which is, you know, when I think about the, the intersection between utilities and the forests and, you know, where from the utility perspective, we see a struggle, right? Where my brain goes is things like, and, and, and this is beyond our state. I mean, this is as much federal as anything, but if there's a way to, to fix it more broadly, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we see challenges in the permitting processes and how long it takes to get someone to, like when I think of forest health and I think of risk, right? The first thing my brain goes to is the risk between the interface of the infrastructure and the forest and, you know, there can be a lot of arm wrestling as to who gets to cut down a particular tree or um, what studies need to be done before you can go in and touch a piece of infrastructure that you know for a fact needs, it, like the maintenance is not a question. It needs to be done. And sometimes when the need arises to do something, you don't always have the luxury of time. I mean, it may not be an, an emergency because something didn't break and fall to the ground, but you, you've got a warning sign. You know that something needs attention. And when you go start interfacing with the process to pull the permit to do what needs to be done to put the protection and the safety in place so that the forest isn't at risk, you are met with roadblock after roadblock after, and it just and people look back and you go we've been trying to get this done for 18 months what is the problem that's that's the kind of thing where when i hear what mr morgan is saying i'm saying to myself are there processes that are in place right now that you know the process is in place because of a you know a piece of legislation and someone's trying to implement current legislation but where it's broken is in the implementation or where there's an unintended additional risk is in the implementation. Are there things we could do legislatively to fix that so that when the need arises to put boots on the ground and get work done, it's a smooth, efficient process, right? I mean, there's, I don't know that anyone would describe it as that today. <laughs> and I think what, what people, people say, well, the, the law says this and the permit process is this. And that's where, that's where my brain goes in terms of, is there a legislature? I, I know there's always a risk, right? When you, when you want to touch 
and I don't have a particular bill in mind when I when I give this example, but there's always a risk when there's a an existing law, and for better or worse, it, that's that is what you're dealing with. When you try and open that up with revisions years down the road, sometimes you get really unintended consequences, right? Like everybody wants to come back in and remake the sausage and the result you get is very different than what you were hoping to achieve. So I, I can appreciate there's always risk with that, but I, that's where my brain is wondering, are there laws on the books right now? Like if as the, as the state force thinks about where do you run into struggle, right? Where are there inefficiencies in, getting things done, whether it's interfacing with utilities or otherwise, where we could do so much more if we didn't have inefficient roadblocks from the way things may have been done 20, 30, 50 years ago, right? Where where could we improve something that is happening right now? And frankly, given tech, given other things, could be done so much more efficiently, so much, so much better and give us back some data that would, you know, inform how to keep improving and keep getting better for the benefit of the force. That's when I'm thinking of what could we be doing, that's where my brain's going. That's a great suggestion. So are you, so Julie, I'm just trying to think, who would we have come talk about that and and, and look at that? Um, because I would take, you know, if we had to say, go look for these, that would probably take yeah. a consultant, right? To do that and go through all probably. the Probably. And so is this, are you talking about, because, you know, I can tell you right now, the first thing I thought is, is state going to come down and tell local governments how to do their processes? That's going to get some. Oh. <laughs> and, but, so I'm like, okay, because we just, you know, we, we just approved this AI thing, which we had some parameters that they kept saying, oh, no one else does it. And I'm like, I don't know if that's true that you're saying that. And that was from this group that wants to profit off of selling the data, right? And I'm curious, are you feeling this is happening on federal, state, or local, or is it, or is it a combination? So I'm just curious, that's how we yeah. look at that. And, and who, and would it be the state forest service or the US forest service? Who is the person to ask what they think are the big robots? Yeah. I would say, you know, speaking from my day-to-day -day work experience, it tends to be, we see more of the roadblocks on the federal lands. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe we have less interface on this on the state forests, um, but I, I I still think there there still can be there still can be those issues, right? Um, so I, I think it's a combination of both. But I think if we could get you know, if you think about how many federal forests we have within our state boundaries, I mean, that's, you look at that and you go, all right, well, we need them for the good of the state. We need them to come to the table and understand that if we're just hitting roadblock after roadblock and we're not, yeah, that's, so who would come speak to that? Oof, that's a, that's a good question. Um Well, I mean, I know, I know I work with a couple of people who, you know, it's their job to right to interface yeah. directly with um, the various ranger offices and, you know, try to get through the process of getting on getting on the ground and getting the work done. And where are those um, where are those roadblocks? I'm sure there's there's someone in my in my day to day who could who could point to the exact places right where when you're trying to get through that process, you just, it just, it doesn't work. And it's, it is, I guess, in, and these are the opinions of Julie Stetzel. I don't want my, <laughs> I can see where this is going to get me maybe into some trouble, but it, it, it can be a real problem, right? I mean, it can be a real problem if, if you're trying to get work done, critically important work, maintenance work and on, I'll just, you know, for example, on a line that's been in place for the last hundred years and you want to get wood poles out of, out of a forest wood poles that are 80 100 years old and you'd like to do that before you get to a failure point to do that with today's standards typically you're going to replace that with a steel structured pole and those those monopoles are going to be taller than the little wooden poles but they're going to be fire resistant right so that our communities care because if a fire comes through you don't want all the infrastructure taken out such that we're going to have to come and rebuild it from scratch. You want it fire hardened. So that, that's a piece of the process. The other piece of the process is 
you want the facilities that the communities need to generate the power to do so in the safest way as possible, right? So it's it's this interesting balance. There's two pieces to the puzzle of coming through and rebuilding facilities. But if someone says, well, that pole's 20 feet taller than the old pole, we can see it now. Yes. <laughs> yes, it might stick above the trees. I appreciate that. But the good news is it's further away from the trees, right? It is now above the trees. We, we have a little more clearance. That clearance sort of equates to safety. Um, and getting people to appreciate that as opposed to saying, well, you know what? Go start from scratch. Go put it somewhere completely different. Go get new land rights. Go get new permits. Not here. <laughs> it's It can take five to seven years to site engineer a brand new line. And I'm probably undercutting that by three years. So these are the struggles, right? If you want to move quickly and you want to do things quickly to get that interface to happen safely, having fights about, you know, does the pole go here? Does the pole go here? When when it's existed for a hundred years, just it makes my head hurt, to be honest. It's it's like, are we really having this conversation? Like if or if or if you have a structure that you know is you're getting a signal right you you're getting some early warning indication you need to get out there you need to do work and somebody goes bup, 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 bup. let's talk about the access let's talk about this let's, and you're like let's talk about the big picture let's talk about what's going to happen if you want 30 studies done and i can't even do the study until next spring but that poll is giving the signal today do you really yeah. Are we making the smart choice? It just sometimes it feels like we're not making the smart choice because there aren't off ramps in the policy and the legislation in the procedure to contemplate. How do you do that? Like who gets to make that decision that this study isn't when weighed against the greater importance of this, the risk to the community, the, to the public and to what you're trying to study? How do you make that balance and do it? in a smart way, given that sometimes you don't have the luxury of time. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the struggle I, that, that we see day in and day out. That's good. Um, great comments and, and uh, good food for thought. And I think about during the Alexander mountain fire and I'll get to you, Mr. Morgan in just a second. Um, the, the rush to protect the XL line that was critical infrastructure and then the 911 line that um, that was going up to Estes Park and if those two critical infrastructures it would have cut off 911 service to Estes Park and the XL um, pipeline that you know the that would have been cast that could have been catastrophic and yeah. and the work that at, at that time of the emergency everything was open to just we've got to do this now and so it got it was heroic efforts to get that protected. So, but that was probably all those things were allowed because it was in a time of emergency, right? And right. so, it, but that doesn't happen if it's not. So Mr. Morgan, your hand's been up, thank you. Excellent, excellent comments, Julie. It's, it's, I sense your frustration. <laughs> I really do, this pent up frustration that you have. I have a lifetime of that myself. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to get too long and windy here, but a short history lesson. <clears throat> in the past, we had designated funding sources for doing forestry work on the ground. Probably not a lot of people around right now that remember what KV money is. Knudsen Vandenberg Act was passed. In the old days, we harvested timber. We paid for that timber. We gave the government the money for that timber, and a portion of that money was sent back to do forest improvement on the ground. That's how they funded the work. KV funds, and those funds were directed back to the land for which the timber was harvested from, for thinning, for fuels reduction, whatever. <clears throat> we're now in a situation where we, we pay work to be done on stewardship contracts, so we don't have, a, it's just bid out for funding sources, so there isn't a, a financial stream that comes back to the Forest Service and when we had that financial stream coming back, automatically a portion of that was designated for the kind of work that we need to do and get done here. 
So I think one of the things that we're missing right now as the timber sales programs have shrunk and we've done more to doing this fuels management work, we don't have a designated financial source that provided those funds. <clears throat> I think that's something we're missing. <clears throat> so we have to find an alternate source for the cash. So now we go out and we put in for grants and we look for money here and there. But that whole system, <clears throat> which leads me to the other part, when you come to want things, when you're trying to get things done and you're asking for a legislator to whatever to do it, it helps if you bring a funding source with, with the proposal. If you if we could develop funding sources, and that's something that you can do legislatively, that you can bring a funding source to try to help do the proposals. As it goes right now, everybody runs around and they write grants and they beg for money, essentially, is how I see it, and have to convince the world that they're that their program or their need is greater than everybody else's. And so I think one of the things we're missing here in our forest health is a consistent funding source. And we maybe need to look at how to do that. Uh, listening to Stenzel, the, uh, I will just try to keep this very short again, but unnecessary or crazy or seemingly useless regulations and permitting and stuff translate. That is an everyday thing anymore. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And as a company, I'm going to get in trouble now. We just say, we don't do work for this agency or we don't do work in this area because it's just become untenable. And then the other thing that happens is you uh, you have certain agencies and certain situations where over history, we keep pretty dang good financial records for everything we do and what it costs. And you just say, well, to do this job in this area is gonna cost 25, 30, 40% more than uh, it's going to cost to do it in another area or another district or for another agency. Do the exact same work. By the time you get done jumping through all the hoops and and the frustrations that you have uh, that allow you to not get the work done. So there is a very real, definite, hard cost to the agencies to do the work. Uh, I'm going to probably get quoted here, I, but traditionally, we can do forestry work for the state of Colorado for around 20 to 25% less than we can do it for the federal government. Exact same work on the ground. And that's just trying to go through as all the permitting and the restrictions and the different things that we have to do. And we can work for private entities a lot of times way cheaper than that. So if I think anything that we could do to introduce common sense, you know, I re everybody realizes that common sense isn't very common, but if we could do anything we could do to reduce and not add to regulations to do the work, we do things anymore that are absolutely positively ridiculous. And I understand Julie's frustration because you would just like to do a better job and deliver. Our company model for years has been to deliver value. And we would like to deliver value. And when you burn up, you struggle to get money and then you burn that money up on garbage. It's hard to stay positive about that. You have heard my soapbox. I'm, that's my frustration to go along with yours, Julie. But I think you're, you're really on to something we have to end this unnecessary regulations, or we're not going to manage any force. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I'm going to now take um, turn this to our next agenda item. We've got some good lists started, I think, and you've got those slides in the um, in your inbox now. Um, I want to make sure we our speaker um, Amanda Horderman's here, and I'm looking forward to her presentation. And so we'll. Um, uh, if you have items at the end of the state, because I want to give her as much time and, and um, as she needs today, 
and we have just till 930 today. If you have ideas or thoughts you want to add to that list, I think we've added some good ideas for 2026. And remember, we still have some other presentations on watershed protections, water, and um, also the biomass studies, which I got another preview of, which I think is going to be really fascinating um, for you all to hear those. So um, so let's turn this over. I'll, Courtney, I'm going to let you introduce our next guest, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. And welcome, Amanda. Thank you, Commissioner. Well. I can say welcome, um, Amanda. I know that you run a wide variety of programs and a big team, and I don't think I can probably uh, capture it well. And so maybe you can introduce yourself from here, but it, I'm really grateful that you came because I know you have a really wide um, expertise. Great, yeah, thanks Thanks all for having me. Um, my name is Amanda Westfordham. I'm Associate Director of the Science and Data Division at the Colorado State Forest Service. And I'm gonna run through really quickly um, just some highlights of some of the programs and projects we have going on in the Science and Data Division. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Thanks again for having me. I'm always happy to share all of the exciting things that the CSFS Science and Data Division are doing. Um, gotta share. I don't do Google much. I'm sorry, it takes me a minute. Um, it should it be is. on the very bottom, yeah, next to the hand. Yep, let's see. Perfect. Okay. All right, do you see that? We do see it. It's we we see the entire PowerPoint um, app. I don't know if there's a way to maybe go into presenter mode. You still see that? We're still seeing the entire app. It's not necessarily a problem. Perhaps if you could um, make the slide bigger. Hmm, that's really strange. I did slide share. Sometimes if you share. Um, your entire window as opposed to just a tab that can help. I'm not sure what you tried to share in from Google. Or if you go to presenter mode first and then share, that might help. Maybe that's what I need to do. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um. This is going to look weird for a minute <laughs> because you're going to see me again. Let's see. I'm just going to share my entire screen and see if that helps. How's that? That's great. Thanks, Amanda. Perfect. Um, so I always like to start uh, when I talk about the Science and Day Division with just our mission at the Colorado State Forest Service um, to achieve stewardship of Colorado's diverse forest environments for the benefit of present and future generations. And we're, of course, part of Werner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University, and we provide staffing for the Division of Forestry in the Department of Natural Resources. And the Science and Data Division specifically is one of six CSFS divisions. So the other ones are forestry services, forest planning and implementation, communications and communities, administration, policy, and legislative affairs. And then we have our executive office that includes um, Matt McCombs, our state forester, Deputy State Forester Christina Burry, our partnership coordinator Scott Woods, and our executive assistant Christy Millsaps. Um, the Science and Data Division was created in 2018, um, and that was part of a reorganization of the Colorado State Forest Service, and it really focuses in applying science on the ground um, to the work that's being done um, to meet the Colorado State Forest Service mission. We have, um, this is our organizational chart. So we have five programs in the Science and Data Division, and right now we have 37 colleagues total. So I'm gonna go through each program and just give some highlights here. 
Um, our first program is the Forest Inventory and Analysis. Our program manager is Dave Hanley out of Grand Junction. And we have FIA crews located there, as well as Fort Collins, Durango, Canyon City, Gunnison, and Meeker. Um, we have a forest health team um, that's managed by our forest entomologist, Dan West, and his team is located at the state office in Fort Collins. We have our geospatial data and analysis program, who's managed by Nick Kotlinski, and their team is also at the state, state office. Uh, we have our academic liaison and experiential learning specialist, Kristen Switzer, um, and she's located at the state office. And we have our forest monitoring program, which is um, the newest program in the science and data division. And that's managed by Ethan Buchholz um, and his team is at the state office and then um, as well as Gunnison. The FIA program is the census of forests in Colorado. So um, we also do the inventory in Wyoming. This is contributes to a nationwide census of the forest. Um, we started the FIA program at the Colorado State Forest Service in 2001. Uh, we are the only state agency that hosts an FIA program in the region, the U.S. Forest Service Region 2. Um, other states have um, federal um, seasonal workers, oftentimes a lot of the states in the southeast. Um, also, the state agency, the State Forestry Agency, hosts their FIA program, so it varies across the country. Um, oftentimes, uh, this work is contracted by the federal government in, in many states, but in Colorado, uh, specifically, we host the FIA program and do all of the Colorado plots, as well as help uh, Wyoming. Sometimes we go help other states in region two, um, like Utah, um, as well as New Mexico, if they're kind of behind on their plots and we have some extra time and help at the end of the season. Um, so this is just a really good picture there of the team at their annual training. And this is a image of their program geography since 2001 through the end of last year. Um, they're out in the field as we speak. And I also have highlighted there, they, uh, one of the crews got to go down to the Bahamas and do a training there with some forestry staff who are interested in um, the national methods in the U.S. Um, so again, this is through an agreement uh, with the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, it's a budget of roughly 1.2 million per year currently. Uh, we're in the process of securing our next five-year agreement uh, with the Rocky Mountain Research Station to continue this work. Our forest health program includes our year, yearly aerial survey, which many of you are familiar with, um, and we do that in cooperation with our U.S. Forest Service state private tribal forestry partners. Um, this team also provides insect and disease training for our field offices across the state. They do landowner consultation and visits, uh, public outreach. They manage the Western Bark Beetle Grant, working with landowners and our foresters out in the field. Um, they do a lot of lab work and IDing insects um, at the state office lab. And they produce the yearly forest health report and the story map that's associated with that. And this is an image of last year's survey. Um, and you can see Dan there on the right and the, the plane that they use for some of their aerial survey work. And in 2023, um, these were the major forest pests in Colorado based on that survey. So mountain pine beetle, spruce beetle, Douglas fir beetle, western bark, balsam bark beetle, and western spruce budworm. And all of these data are available online. Um, if you go to our website and click on the story map, you can zoom into an area and see what pests are specifically found in a given area. You can also look at previous year's data and see how it's changing over time. Um, to expand our forest health monitoring program, we received some uh, funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law and we were able to hire three new staff to the program um, and so 
this has really yielded a lot of more monitoring and data collection across the state. Um, we've been setting out traps for bark beetles across the state, developed a new research protocol to monitor pollinators, which was a response to um, the Colorado Native Pollinating Insect Health Study that was published through DNR. And um, you can see here on the map some of the plots that we've established over the past um, year. And then I'll move into our geospatial data and analysis or our GIS program. So this program is um, funded with our state um, dollars, primarily healthy forest fiber communities, but we also get some support from federal programs um, that the GIS team supports. So the ways they support our partners and our foresters um, in the field. This team provides um, technical support, both internally as well as externally, working with a lot of our state partners. Um, they provide services in things like ARC Pro and Survey123. They do administration, development, and support of the Colorado Forest Atlas, which I'll highlight in, a, in another slide. Um, the forest tracker that, that they've been working with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute to develop. GeoTrax, which is an internal reporting um, software that we use, the Colorado Wildfire Risk Assessment, and then just various, again, state partner work like the State Land Board and Colorado State Parks. And we've started um, moving more into working with our monitoring team on the GIS program to use things like drones and remote sensing. <laughs> Um, to think about how we can more effectively monitor forest treatments. That's just a picture of the team there. And then this is an image from the Colorado Forest Atlas. So this is an interactive uh, web portal and we have different applications depending on um, if you're a public user or registered professional user. Anyone can be a registered professional user. You just go to the website and sign up. Uh, we have all of our data there from the Forest Action Plan in 2020 in that application, and you can run county level reports. We have our Wildfire Risk Reduction Planner, which is more of our professional um, application uh, for practitioners. And um, we have our wildfire risk viewer, which is really uh, focused on a public tool for assessing wildfire risk. Not pictured here, um, if you're a registered user, we also have a um, file application. It's like a library where you can go and download uh, statewide data from these applications. The risk assessment, um, for a bit of history, it was first published by the Colorado State Forest Service in 2012. And at that time, we had a website called CoRAP. Five years later, it was updated um, and it became CoRA just because CoRAP was a portal where we only had the Colorado Wildfire Risk Assessment and those associated applications. But then we launched the Forest Atlas and had this new Forest Action Plan application we, we knew we wanted to launch. And so we wanted to make that one-stop shop for GIS data um, that we, we serve externally. And so um, in 2017, we just kind of cut off the P and just called it CORA. And then we updated it again in 2022. So those are the data that are currently on the website and we are planning a three-year update cycle now recognizing um, how rapidly things are changing in the state we felt that changing from five years to three years made a lot of sense um, and again uh, that is supported by our healthy forest fiber communities um, so our state funding and we have here on the left just a comparison of our improvements over time so a good thing about updating is not just new data. There's also new methodologies available um, and we're excited to see what we can do in the next update. And this is a screenshot uh, from the public facing wildfire risk viewer. And one of the uh, tools that first appears is just a, a point tool where you can go to a location 
and evaluate what the potential fire intensity would be in that neighborhood um, if a fire were to occur. So this, this is just giving people an idea of their community and what if and when a fire comes, what the potential intensity of that fire would be. And that's based on things like fuels and topography, flame length associated with those fuels. Um, and it's a, a snapshot in time. So it's not dynamic. It doesn't change when the weather changes. It's really just a snapshot in time at the potential fire intensity there. So the Forest Tracker is a more recent project that the GIS team has been involved with, and that's partnering really closely with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute. Um, and so this is a place where we're going to house um, woody vegetation management activities. Um, and this is gonna be cross agency. So it will include federal data, it will include state data, and that will be in the first launch. And then um, once we get through cleaning a lot of the more localized data that we've received, uh, we will start to pull in a lot more of that data that we're getting from collaboratives that may not necessarily be in the state data set, as well as local fire uh, jurisdictions and other local fire, um, excuse me, other local agencies like NGOs that are doing forest management work on the ground. Um, and this will also include prescribed fire. So it's not just mechanical treatments, it's also prescribed fire. We wanna make sure that it's open access. And so it's gonna be um, empowered by ARC Online. And so there'll be a dashboard where you can see statistics, summary information. Um, you can compare the data with information in that forest atlas. So you could download um, data from the forest atlas. If you use GIS, you could download a shape file from the forest tracker and really start to answer some questions um, about how we're seeing different changes over time. So once we have a new wildfire risk assessment, we're gonna be able to think about how some changes um, have happened at more of that landscape scale over time in things like fire, potential fire intensity, for example. So there's a lot of potential with these data um, and that would be certainly something that folks like the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute who are doing research in wildfire risk um, at that local level could, could take advantage of. And it can really help us better understand how our forest management is improving conditions on the ground over time. So we're really looking forward to launching this and providing that really transparent statewide information about the work that's being done. That kind of ties into our forest monitoring program. Um, so our forest monitoring program does work really closely with our GIS program. And the intent of the forest monitoring program is to develop pre and post treatment plots. Um, and it is supported largely by our forest restoration wildfire risk mitigation grant program for worm. And we are collaborating again with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute we're also collaborating with the Rocky Mountain Research Station and using some new technologies like drones to make our monitoring more efficient and thinking about how we can use LIDAR. Um, and the intent of pre and post monitoring is just to develop recommendations for forest management. So what are we seeing that is changing? How are we responding to climate change on the ground? in our treatments, uh, what recommendations can we make in forest management plans moving forward? And this this takes time. This, this is not something we can learn in a year. Um, it, it does take time and monitoring the forest response over many years to better understand um, what's happening on the ground. And I think I switched back. Let's see, I did. And that's... Um, a picture of our forest monitoring team there. And it includes um, Ashley Woman, who is our forest carbon specialist. And she is part of the forest monitoring team as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about carbon in just a minute. So again, monitoring forest treatments, we're really thinking about like 
what's happening on the ground, defining that area that we want to evaluate, um, thinking about the potential impacts of climate change and vulnerabilities in that area, evaluating what are the management objectives, um, what were the landowner objectives, what were the land management objectives in this area, and then identifying um, what's happening on the ground over time and monitoring to see what's changing. So some of these graphs are showing changes in canopy base height over time, uh, pre and post treatment, uh, changes in uh, post treatment torching index. So what are we thinking about? Is the intent of this treatment to mitigate the risk of canopy fire and these are ways that we can monitor and see and evaluate if this is really happening over time. And another project that uh, the team is involved in is called the Adaptive Silviculture for Climate Change. This is a network of study sites across the U.S. and Canada. Um, and it is the primary investigator is Linda Nagel. She's in Utah now. She used to be at Colorado State University. And um, we have three sites in Colorado uh, at the State Forest at Taylor Park and in the San Juans where you can see there's three different forest cover types where we're evaluating different treatment types um, to see how different types of treatments, so resistance treatments where we're really trying to manage the forest for how it exists currently, to resilience treatments where we're trying to manage the forest um, to come back after a disturbance and be resilient, and then transition. So managing for us to think more in the future about what would the climate be like in this site in 20 years, and for example, and should we be planting species that are more appropriate uh, given what changes we're seeing? So this is really an experience, experimental um, protocol to look at how different treatments are changing over time. And this is, again, a long-term study um, that will be at least 20 to 30 years. Um, so it's really exciting. Uh, I think a bid just went out either last week or this week for the treatments at the State Forest. Um, and so really looking forward to get that, that um, going at the State Forest study site. And I mentioned this earlier, but we're just really starting to look at how we can use different technologies in our monitoring, such as LIDAR and drones. Our forest carbon inventory came out of House Bill 221012. And this is really cool because we're using our forest inventory and analysis data to develop these baselines for how much carbon stocks and fluxes are in our forests. And then we're also looking at wood products. And this has been a broad collaboration with the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at CSU, as well as folks at CAL FIRE um, who had an established methodology that we modified for Colorado uh, that is using, again, that FIA data. And I'm kind of going fast because I realize I'm almost out of time here. Um, these are just some of our draft results. Um, so we can look at uh, carbon stocks and fluxes at the county level. We can look at it by forest cover type. And finally, um, our, our experiential learning program um, is really focused on the ways that we can support students and supporting the next generation of forestry professionals in the state. So. Um, Kristen Switzer, who's pictured here on the left, she manages our internship program. We had 21 interns this year, and they were supported by a range of funds. Um, some of them were supported by U.S. Forest Service funding. Some of them uh, worked half of the summer with the Loveland Fire Rescue Authority and half of the summer with us. That was two of them. Some of them are supported by our Colorado Restoring Forest Fund. Um, and some of them are supported by various state and federal programs. So Kristen also, um, in addition to managing our internship program, she also teaches at CSU this semester. She's teaching forest ecology, which is part of our um, online uh, advanced silviculture certificate program. And I just want to um, say we have about three minutes left. Yeah, um, for our meeting. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'll leave it open for questions. I was going to highlight the statewide forest biomass assessment, but it sounds like maybe some folks have seen recent presentations on this. Um, it's been in the works for a while. Um, it kind of got paused uh, a little bit when um, Kurt Mackis retired, whom some of you know, he was really leading this study. Um, and part of it is an update to the publication, uh, Would You Sinclair at the Turn of the 21st Century? Uh, but the exciting, one of the exciting things is not only are we updating that component, we're also now using FIA data to get better estimates of um, biomass and classifying um, what can be um, utilized in the state. So I will end it there. Um, that's, thank you. that's my information. Yep. Yeah, thank you. You covered a lot of ground there. I appreciate that. I tried. I went really fast. But you did great. And Amanda, thank you for your work with that um, pilot program with Loveland Fire Rescue Authority. Um, I'm, I know as commissioners in Larimer County, we were proud to provide the grant money to pay for those salaries as well and support that program. So I'm anxious to see how that um, program can be replicated or continue. I thought that was a great opportunity and we were, we were proud to help support that so financially. Um, thank you for all your work. And this was a great presentation. I'm hoping we can maybe send the slides to everyone um, Courtney, and so that we can, um, if anybody have any questions. So any burning questions? And if you think of questions later, we can always ask Courtney to send them to Amanda. Um, any burning questions today? That's a lot of ground to cover with a lot of stuff happening. Pat Dorsey. I was just going to ask Amanda if she wouldn't mind typing her contact information in the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I know I went through a lot really quickly. So, yeah, it's a lot of ground. I know these meetings were, were tight, but um, appreciate all that information. It's a lot of great stuff happening. And thank you for being here today and uh, your time. We really appreciate getting to have this all condensed and shared in one presentation. So, um, and we'll get those slides out. Well, Amanda, um, unless there's other big questions, I'm going to assume that we're going to just kind of digest this and then add this to the list. If you have some ideas or thoughts that um, ended up being um, something you wanted to look at or put on the list now while you're thinking about it, please send those to Courtney so she can add them to the list that we started today. And um, uh, yeah, just thank you, Amanda. It's um, great to have you here and your expertise. And thanks for all the work. I mean, just that pilot program, the programs that you've been doing, it's just tremendous, the partnerships and relationships that you have been um, nurturing and bringing along. So anybody else? Okay, well, it's 9.30, everybody. Happy Friday. Have a lovely weekend. I hope you get outside and uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there okay, I'll take... Mr. Morgan is the first and Julia is the second. All those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Hey, everyone, have a great weekend. Thank you all for your time and attention. And uh, I think we've had some great discussions today. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you. Take care, everybody.